Well, it's perfectly true that if you type grand strategy into the Google search engine, you wind up with hundreds of thousands of answers. So I had to try and write a book that had something extra, something that nobody else had got before. And I was tremendously fortunate to find the verbatim accounts of Winston Churchill's war cabinet. And I've managed to fit that into the overall structure of a great debate, a passionate, hard-fought debate between the four key men in the West. Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, George Marshall, and Lord Allenbrook. The way in which these masters and commanders, political masters and military commanders, interacted to create grand strategy between uh, Pearl Harbor in December 1941 and the death of Roosevelt in 1945. What this book tries to do is to get you right into the engine room of the creation of grand strategy. Hundreds of thousands of men's lives depended on the decision that these um, men made. These four men, um, none of whom wanted to be stuck on the outside with the other three uh, disagreeing with them. None of them wanted to be outmaneuvered. And so they danced this very complicated minuet between them to ensure that their view of grand strategy prevailed. I've gone to all the original um, documents and, uh, and papers and letters and diaries and, um, and looked at what every person thought of everyone else, often on a day-by-day, -day, even hour-by-hour -hour basis sometimes, and, uh, and try to work out the way in which the Allies ground out a, a, a road map for, uh, for ultimate victory. As I was writing this book, I was really surprised at the level of dissension, of um, sometimes of fury, of passionate disagreement between the masters and commanders about how grand strategy should be, where they should attack, when they should attack. The whole policy of attacking first in North Africa, and then Italy, and then into France and Germany was fought over tooth and nail by these four men. Um, at some stage you would have the Prime Minister shaking his fist in the face of the Chief of the Imperial General Staff. You would have uh, people having to clear meetings in order to have shouting matches. You would have Americans fighting the British and generals fighting the uh, politicians. And you would have at one point a, uh, a general wanting to climb over the desk and hit one of the other uh, members of the uh, general staff sitting opposite him. The creation of grand strategy is an awful lot more complicated and also an awful lot more emotional and visceral than you'd ever imagined. There was constant tension between the Prime Minister Winston Churchill and the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, Lord Allenbrook. Uh, these men saw each other constantly, they were arguing over grand strategy all the time. Sometimes they would be spending 10 hours a day in each other's company. They were not friends, they weren't enemies, but they weren't um, natural friends. And yet they both knew that they needed the other. Brooke needed the Prime Minister because he was the Minister of Defence as well and the ultimate political power in the nation. Churchill needed Brooke because back in 1915 he had made a catastrophic error over the Dardanelles uh, campaign in, uh, in Turkey during the First World War and it nearly destroyed his career and he never wanted to go back to that. And so as a result he never overruled the Chiefs of Staff on the military issue during the Second World War. And so these two men had to somehow create a modus vivendi. And the way they did it was through constant attempts at persuasion, charm, intelligence, wit, um, hard work, knowledge of the facts, uh, erudition, but um, persuasion. And what they created with this immense personal tension between the two, sometimes it was the immovable objects and the unstoppable force, what they created ultimately was the creative tension that's needed to, uh, to come up with the correct strategy for winning the war. There's simply no way that men of that, uh, of that um, caliber fighting the war to the extent that they did could have kept it up for six years if there weren't also moments of levity and charm and good humour.
And uh, one of the things I've tried to concentrate on in this book is uh, the way in which Winston Churchill, who was the funniest man imaginable and who um, could hardly um, go through an entire cabinet minister, uh, meeting without having a, a joke and uh, without alleviating the, um, the seriousness of the situation with a, with a gag or an aperçu. And uh, it's important to have that side also of any book and not just the death and destruction.